In business today, three things to know. First, the World Economic Forum on Africa kicks off in Nigeria. Amid a government facing a crisis over kidnapping and bombings, the nation attempts to showcase its economic might. Then, we have interviews with the head of the Nigerian stock market and the founder of one of Nigeria's largest banks about bringing more financial power to individual Nigerians. And fast food workers order up a worldwide protest over what they earn, a half-baked idea or one gaining traction. A rise exchange from Abuja, Nigeria starts now. Welcome to Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, where thousands of people from across the globe have gathered for the World Economic Forum on Africa. They are here amid an incredible force of security. We will have a rundown of all of today's events and a preview of tomorrow coming up. I'm Andrew Schmertz. I'm Julian Phillips in New York. I'll have all the latest business news from the U.S. in a moment. But first, let's go back to Andrew in Abuja. Julian, the theme of the forum this year is creating jobs and new businesses across Africa, where the income inequality gap remains one of the largest challenges for the continent. The conference began on Thursday with President Goodluck Jonathan, who is under, as you know, intense pressure over his handling of an ongoing kidnapping situation involving some 300 school children and bombings by the terrorist group Boko Haram. Our Jerome Evans reports on some late-day protests. United in grief, mothers of the missing girls sit together in front of the charred remains of Chibok Secondary School. This was the last place their daughters were seen. Four weeks after the kidnapping, the groundswell of outrage around the world is stronger than ever. In recent days, several countries have pledged assistance to Nigeria and criticized the government's response. Today, President Goodluck Jonathan says, we're grateful for the help. If you had refused to come because of fear, the terrorists would have jubilated and even would have committed more havoc. But you are coming here to support us morally. It's a major blow on the terrorists. And by God's grace, we'll conquer the terrorists. With pledges of assistance from China, the United Kingdom, France and the United States, there will be high-level discussions taking place on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum, which starts in earnest today. But as President Jonathan welcomes delegates to this World Economic Forum, he's more aware than anybody of the clever political juggle he has to perform. On the one hand, he needs to reach out to the international community on security, and especially in the case of the missing schoolgirls. But on the other hand, he has to present Nigeria as the destination for investment in Africa and a model of successful democracy. The security situation didn't stop the world's leaders coming in their droves. There are delegates here from every continent, including a sizable contingent from China. The Chinese Premier Li Keqiang pledged China's help to bring Africa higher living standards, better health care and social progress. Targeting some specific areas around infrastructure, uh, building a, ro a road network that will link all the major African uh, uh, capitals, uh, building, uh, building rail railroads uh, mm -hmm. that will support uh, intra-Africa trade, building airports uh, that will support intra-Africa travel. Although some analysts accuse China of exploiting Africa's natural resources and workforce, delegates here see the relationship as mutually beneficial. Today, Chinese officials announced $10 billion of spending on infrastructure projects across Africa, suggesting that Beijing is taking an inclusive view of Africa's needs. But for the parents in Chibok still waiting for news of their missing daughters, security now is of greater concern than future economic growth. And it is their plight that will continue to dominate the agenda at the World Economic Forum. Jerome Evans, Abuja, Arise News. Thanks, Jerome. We'll have more from Nigeria in a moment. But first, back to Julian in New York. 
Uh, thanks, Andrew. Now for a look at how the markets did today. The Dow closing up today to 16,550. The S&P 500 down to 1875. And the Nasdaq end of the day also down to 4051. Here's a look at the stocks we are watching today. Well, the head of Apple's North America sales, Zane Rowe, will be replaced by the current head of sales in Japan and Korea, Doug Beck. Apple closing at down to $587.99. Well, more troubling news for Barclays. The British bank sat, says it's slashing 19,000 jobs in the next three years, and 7,000 of those cuts will be in the investment bank division, starting with 2,000 cuts overall this year. Barclays closing at $17.73. Well, Amazon is expanding its Sunday package delivery service to 15 more cities across the country, including Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, New Orleans, and Dallas. Amazon first rolled out the service as part of a new deal with the U.S. Postal Service in November to New York and Los Angeles. Amazon closing at $288.32. Now for a look at commodities, gold closing at $1,289.40 an ounce and oil closing at $100.25 per barrel. Well, it was the second straight day of testimony to Congress for Fed Chair Janet Yellen on the economic outlook for the nation. And despite the bright outlook, Yellen says the housing sector is one of the weakest spots for the economy and address concerns over interest rates. Interest rates are unlikely to begin rising until we are in a strong economic recovery. So we will, we eventually will start to raise interest rates. I, I mean, I'm assuming the economy will continue to recover and at some point that will become appropriate. Well, for more, we turn to Peter Cardillo, Chief Market Economist at Rockwell Global Capital. A regular here, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Okay, the second day, uh, Janet Yellen's testifying on Capitol Hill. Were you surprised by anything she said? No, absolutely not. And, you know, I think she did a great job yesterday and today. Uh, she was very diplomatic. You know, she didn't uh, get herself pinned down uh, as to when they're going to raise interest rates. She basically re reiterated everything that she's been saying all along, you know, uh, when the economy gets to the point that, uh, uh, they feel that uh, they're going to raise interest rates, they will. Uh, she basically made it quite clear that, uh, you know, they're going to continue with the reduction of the bond buying program. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps maybe after six months after that, which is uh, probably uh, uh, the beginning or the latter part of the second quarter of 2015, uh, we can see a change in monetary policy. So I think, you know, um, she's been... She, she uh, gave a good economic forecast. Uh, she says the economy is picking up. Uh, and, of course, she also warned that, uh, you know, there's a weak spot, and that is the uh, housing, uh, the real estate market. Oh, well, I guess, yeah, of course. And, and we, we, we talked about this over the last few days. In terms of the housing market itself, you would have to, I, I would say, in my mind, keep these interest rates down by the banks low in order to keep things solvent. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, obviously, but you know, I think what we have to realize is that we're seeing softness again in the market simply because of the fact that uh, we've come a long way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially here in the Northeast. I mean, uh, here in, 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 in the um, uh, uh, New York area, I mean, you know, prices uh, uh, have uh, returned to their peak levels in, mm -hmm. in most cases. And so... Uh, we're coming off of that peak level, and so that's why I think we're seeing this softness. It's not so much a question of uh, perhaps, you know, much higher interest rates. Yes, uh, the 30-year mortgage rate has gone up a bit, sure. but certainly not to the point where it would just, uh, you know, clobber, clobber the market. So I think it's a question of prices and it's a question of the market coming down, adjusting uh, perhaps over the next uh, uh, four to five uh, months. Okay, you're talking about an adjustment. We're talking about what, what kind of percentage are we talking about? Oh, I don't think much of a percentage. I don't mean, I, I'm not, you know, suggesting that prices are going to come down that very much. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I think they'll stop climbing, cli climbing for a while. Peter, here's one thing that, I, maybe it perhaps it didn't surprise me, but I think there, there's going to be some backlash on this from some sectors of the, the political world and, of course, the business world, I guess. Minimum wage. And she's saying that, you know, any 
increase right now would have a detrimental effect on jobs. What, what, what's your take on this? And well, you know, theoretically, she's right. I mean, let's face it, you know, a, a, a mom and pop shop, uh, smaller industries, you know, um, anytime it, uh, it hits them, it hits them quite hard. Sure. And so, um, even though, I mean, you know, what's ten dollars and fifty cents an hour? Absolutely nothing. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, it does have a psychological impact. Not only psychological, but it has a material uh, impact as well. And so, um, I, I think she's correct in saying that. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see about that. But there's also, we, we, we've run out of time, but also, of course, fast, fast food workers are looking for an increase. That kind of a hefty one. We'll see what happens there. Peter, it's always a delight. Thank you so much for joining Good us. Good to be here. Okay. Coming up, more from Andrew Schmerz at the World Economic Forum on Africa in Nigeria when we return. Stay with us. Mainstream news has covered all of the issues of the world, which are like this, through a very narrow, narrow lens. And at Arise News, we do things different. We cover every culture, every angle. Our mission is to go to these places, to these communities, whether they're in Africa, whether they're in Europe, Asia, the United States, the Caribbean. And we're going to find these stories, and we're going to tell them to our audience, stories that they probably never heard of before, and stories that they'll find interesting and engaging. Welcome back to Abuja. Domestic participation in the Nigerian stock exchange hit about 50% in 2013, but there is more work to be done. Joining us is the CEO of the Nigerian stock exchange, Oscar Anima. Mr. Anima, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. So domestic participation is getting better, but how do you continue to grow sort of the retail investor base into the exchange? Um, we are actually trying to reposition the retail investors uh, to participate more in collective investment schemes. Uh, we think that um, given the need for significant financial education um, as a way of protecting investors, uh, it might be better to steer them to us uh, uh, collective investment schemes. Sort of mutual funds example? Mutual funds. Uh, we've, we've also introduced exchange traded funds. Uh, there are about 26 uh, mutual funds that have a memorandum listing on the stock exchange. We have two exchange traded funds. One tracks uh, NSC 30 index. It's an equity uh, ETF. And the other one is a gold ETF that tra tracks uh, gold prices. Um, if you look at the statistics, um, our market is really uh, a retail market in so many ways. Um, uh, we have over 5 uh, million uh, accounts in this uh, CSD, which is the clearinghouse. And over 4.9 uh, million of those are retail accounts. So it really uh, takes time, but we're working on it. What is the hesitation among Nigerians? Is there still a trust issue, do you think, in the markets? Um, there's still a trust issue. As you know, um, most of the retail investors uh, got their fingers burnt uh, in 2008 when the bubble bust. And uh, that was our first significant market downturn. I call it our own Great Depression. Um, and a number of those in investors uh, felt like they were told that you couldn't lose in the capital market. So they were not doing and we risk. We saw that everywhere. Yeah, they were not doing risk management. So what we preach right now is appropriate asset allocation, uh, good uh, diversification within your uh, various asset classes, and that people get educated about what they're investing in. And that is why we're trying to stir uh, retail investors to us, collective investment funds. What we hear from American investors is that there still is a little bit of a lack of transparency with the stocks traded on the Nigerian Stock Exchange and some liquidity issues. How are you addressing those concerns? Um, with regards to transparency, we've done a lot. Uh, I believe that the feedback we're getting from the various portfolio investors is that transparency has really improved. Um, we have an ex-compliance report which tracks the compliance levels of our companies. We have our broker tracks report which tracks the compliance levels of the broker dealer community. We put out market quality reports which show you effective spreads, realized spreads, fill rates, price improvements, execution speed, and the like. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, improvement with regards to transparency. If you go to our website, there's a ton of information. We're distributing more market data than we've ever done across the world. 
uh, because we've really enhanced the products that we have. We have uh, real-time uh, uh, feeds that show you depth, complete depth of book. And, 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 uh, yeah. and also improve the quality of the reporting companies themselves? Now, with regards to reporting, we've introduced international financial reporting standards, uh, and we've introduced um, what we call our ex-issuer portal, which allows companies to file their uh, financials through a secure uh, portal. And there are templates uh, that are available so that what you're seeing is more standardized, and uh, there's a ton of information that is, is uh, reported that they did not used to report before. We continue to improve on that because we want complete transparency uh, so that people will have the kind of confidence they need uh, in order to invest in these companies. What kind of companies are going public right now in the Nigerian Stock Exchange? What kind of industries that maybe are going public today that, that were not years ago? Well, there was one uh, recent uh, IPO that we had, uh, the first uh, exploration and production company. Uh, it, it's called Seplat. Uh, it's an IPO that um, was a dual listing between Lagos and London. They, they tried to raise $500 million uh, on the strike price. Uh, they had uh, $700 million uh, worth of demand. 48% of that came from local investors. Uh, so there's significant uh, interest in the oil and gas space uh, to come to the market. Uh, we will be listing another company uh, towards the end of this month uh, that is in the oil and gas servicing uh, space. So I would say uh, we've done, with Sepla, there are so many firsts. For example, uh, it was a book build process, and three days after the pricing, uh, the securities settled. That means that on the day of listing, if you were a retail investor, if you were an institutional investor, if you wanted to sell, you could sell. Uh, that is a first for uh, a capital raising in Nigeria. In speaking to people here at the World Economic Forum, are you finding that they're familiar enough with the Nigerian Stock Exchange as part of your mission here, obviously, to help educate the community? I think that um, we've done a lot of work going, traveling around the world, uh, uh, the U.S., Europe, and uh, uh, the rest of Africa, and now we're beginning to look at the Middle East and Asia. Uh, so we think that the U.S. investors, the professional uh, portfolio managers, uh, know our story, especially the Africa funds, uh, frontier funds, global emerging market funds. They know our story, but we continue to tell them because there are so many things that we continue to uh, roll out into the marketplace. For example, we have a state-of-the-art technology platform that we rolled out in September of last year uh, with fixed uh, protocol. Uh, that means that you can access us uh, through the order management uh, systems of broker-dealers. Uh, we have over 100 million telephone lines, cell phone lines. These cell phones can access us uh, through uh, the order management uh, systems of broker-dealers. So there's a lot of improvement in technology, uh, in uh, processes, uh, in governance. Governance is a big area for us, um, and, and segmentation of the market. So really, people have to continue to keep up to date with what we're doing. Okay. Oscar, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to New York and Julian. Thanks, Andrew. Time now for our business ticker, stories making news around the world. Well, the World Wide Web is getting wider. The United Nations reports the Internet will have 3 billion users by the end of the year. That's 40 percent of the entire human population. Hmm. Well, this is good news for global industry since two-thirds of users are actually in the developing world. Well, FedEx has announced it is changing up its pricing plan. Boxes will ship based on their size and dimensions rather than their weight. The pricing shift from weight to volume comes as FedEx failed to meet its quarterly profits and cut its forecast due to rising fuel costs. And China is sending in the reinforcements. That's right. Chinese police will be on the streets of Paris this summer. French police say the large amounts of cash Chinese tourists carry with them has made them the targets for muggings and pickpock pickpocketing. All well, those French thieves better be on guard. Word on the streets is Chinese don't play. Ahead, fast food wage wars go global. You're watching a rise exchange. I think news does make people put things in black and white terms just so that they have a dividing line between what their viewers like and dislike. When they like see a person of color, they either think that 
they're not going to do anything. They're either on drugs or they got pregnant at an early age. And I just want to say that that's not true. It tends to reflect more the interests of the upper income people and the upper income interests. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Uh, welcome back to The Exchange. It's expected to be the biggest fast food workers protest ever organized. Calling for higher wages, workers across the globe plan to strike next week in 33 countries. They'll target fast food giants like McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Wendy's. Well, joining us on the phone with more on this massive planned process is Stacy Swimp, spokesperson for Project 21, an initiative of the National Center for Public Policy. Welcome, Stacy. Hi. Fast food workers around the world, Stacey, plan to strike, as we talked about uh, next week, globally, ranging from developing countries like Africa, well, that's a continent, of course, El Salvador, to the U.S. and European countries like England and Ireland. W what's your reaction to all this? Insanity. It's the first thing I think to myself, a lack of knowledge. It's interesting that someone in Africa would be marching or picketing or protesting demanding minimum wage when it was actually in South Africa that minimum wage was used by the South African, South African or the white uh, uh, colonizers, if you will, uh, implemented minimum wage to discriminate against the black African workers. That's a fact. Look it up. So how ironic that in the same continent where minimum wage was used to marginalize poor people uh, from getting into the workforce, now they're talking about they want to fight for the very same thing that caused discrimination. That doesn't make sense. And if I may quickly say so, the bottom line is any time that you escalate minimum wage, really what happens is you knock off the career ladder millions of young people in particular because every time minimum wage goes up, then the businesses that are having to pay uh, payroll taxes, overhead, and such, uh, they cannot afford to keep particularly young people in entry-level jobs. So, it's, you know, I understand the need to or desire to make more money uh, because you want a better quality of life. That's why we go to school. That's why we go to vocational training. We do the things we need to do to qualify for more gainful employment instead of dictating to the owner, I want you to pay me $15 an hour, even though in many cases I only have $7 skills. Right. You know, Stacey, a lot of people would agree with that. In fact, just earlier today, as you probably know, Janet Yellen, chair of the Fed, said increasing the minimum wage uh, just across the board, forget just fast foods, would likely have negative effects on the economy. I, I, I'm sure that you would agree with that as well. Well, you know, our economy in America was intended to uh, be based on what we call a free market. Now, the free market, I'm not stupid. I know it's not always fair. I know sometimes <laughs> people discriminate. But what happens is when you get government, for example, mm -hmm. trying to dictate wages in the free market, <clears throat> then it eliminates competition. Competition in anything and everything is what does and what should determine market price. So now right. listen, if these people want to picket uh, uh, certain businesses and try to force their hand, then I, I'm not saying they should go and do that, but that's perfectly within their rights as a consumer in a free market society. It may or may not force those businesses to make a decision. Sure. But don't try to make, it, uh, make the government force the businesses to set a wage that most of you aren't, you aren't even qualified for. Stacy, we have less than a minute here. I just want to put one point in. Conversely, on the, on the other side, there are a lot of people that are working these jobs that can't get anything more. They've got this. They're still on public assistance. Is, is there some point where you might want to ra raise the wage where at least these people can get off of welfare and, and, and get suitable housing? I think the key to getting off of welfare is education and job training, mm. not to be more dependent on the government and to force people out of work and to force businesses to close, because eventually something has to give. So I think for people on welfare, you know, I've known people on welfare. I've had family members on welfare. You sure. know what they did? They had to work a little. They went to school. And right. They did the things they needed to do so they could get a better job. They've got to take some responsibility, understanding what they're faced with, to qualify themselves for the more. And that'll have to be the last word, Stacey Swim. Thank you so much for joining us on Arise Exchange. Thank you so much. Okay. Up next, back to the World Economic Forum on, uh, on Africa and Andrew Smirch when Arise Exchange returns. I don't think the television news in the United States. I don't think the television news in the United States reflects the diversity of the world. I don't think it does a great job of even reflecting the diversity of the United States. When you are watching TV, you don't really see a lot of different cultures. There are plenty of other places that people might not even know about. We are living in a global 
culture and you cannot hide news that is happening when there's so much social media. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Jim Ovia is the founder and former CEO of Zenith Bank, and he's here to talk about the economy. It is the World Economic Forum afterwards, after all. And the theme here is about creating jobs in Africa. What are some of the initiatives to improve the employment situation? Thank you very much. The theme for wealth on Africa, this, the wealth, this particular wealth is on Africa, different from the one in Davos. Uh, Davos is more like more of developed economies, the Americas, the European countries and as well as a few emerging markets. Uh, many African country investors, participants, could not really attend uh, the um, World Economic Forum um, in Davos. But the one on Africa, specifically for Africans, focused on Africans, trying to bring up various investment opportunities in various parts of Africa. And uh, we are very excited and pleased that um, Wealth on Africa is now holding for the first time in the annals of wealth in Nigeria. Uh, a number of participants have never been to Nigeria before. Some are visiting Abuja for the very first time and they couldn't believe that Abuja is this beautiful country, this beautiful city, you know, and Nigeria is such a beautiful country also. Regardless of what people may say about security, no security, but at the same time, investors will go to where returns are high. Investors will go to where opportunities are high. And many investors are beginning to realize and anticipate the fact that return on investment in Nigeria is great. So they are here and they are very fully welcome. Creating jobs, which is a team of wealth, is very interesting because within this period in time, this uh, federal government of Nigeria will be making all efforts to create employment, create a enabling environment such that the youths will be well empowered to become entrepreneurs on micro small and medium scale enterprises so that they could create jobs themselves and they become employers of labor themselves not necessarily looking for jobs salary to earn. like, like um, stressing entrepreneurship in other words yes entrepreneurship that's the focus and that's the intention the government is beginning to create a enabling environment you must have shown about the, uh, you, um, your win program and we also have various NGOs various programs various activities for example we run NGO known as Youth Empowerment and ICT Foundation, where we create opportunity for the youths between the ages of 18 and 24, 25, just out of university, who will design some applications or some program or come up with some business idea, some business model, where they could employ half a dozen or a dozen persons in the next one to two years, and we disburse up to about 20 million to them. And that is beginning to create some opportunities for them to how, empower themselves. That's very interesting. So how is the, the grants of that money allocated? How do you go about in finding those individuals? We have annual seminars, annual conferences where we send out uh, emails, loads of emails, and uh, they all will participate and attend and send us their programs, send us their designs, send us their business ideas, send us their business initiatives. And we hold these annual conferences at the Civic Center. And at that opportunity, we're able to pick and choose those that have performed exceedingly well. Over a dozen of them will be chosen at all possible, about, about 100. That's how we choose them. Purely very competitive and very professionally done. I with most many emerging markets, the question becomes of income inequality as Nigeria becomes wealthier and wealthier. How do you see income inequality in Nigeria and what can be done to close that gap? I guess you already mentioned one, which is improving entrepreneurship. Income inequality is always a very, very touchy issue anywhere in the world, in any country in the world. You see that income inequality, you also look at the demography of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria of about uh, 170 million people you will beginning to see that the gap between the well-to-do in terms of financially, in terms of being empowered and enabled, compared to those who you will say live below the poverty line. The gap is closing, slightly closing. Whereas in some other countries, the gap is probably widening. Also, if you look at also the demography of other countries that have large population, India, China, Turkey, Brazil, or Indonesia, you see that income inequality it mimics the one for Nigeria, or Nigeria mimics also income inequality in those um, other countries, looking at the demography of those various countries. Okay, Jim, thank you so much. 
Andrew, a lot of uh, expectations coming out of uh, the World Economic Forum. What were your impressions of the first day? Julian, two impressions really stick out today. First, the massive security presence throughout the city, the military all over the streets, very visible presence from the airport all the way through to the route to the Hilton Hotel here where the forum is being held. Second, even though the Nigerian government really would like everyone to focus on what's going on at the forum, of course, and talk about economic policy, you can't escape the story about the kidnapped girls. Protests are going on throughout the day. The media has been very tough on the president and the administration here, and that issue is certainly not going away and certainly dominating the headlines. Day two of the World Economic Forum on Friday will report from Abuja again. Julian? Thanks, Andrew, and we'll see you right here on The Exchange tomorrow. Stay with us.